Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 102. This episode is with Robert Ariza, who is so nice and so talented, and you're just going to love him. I saw Robert uh, this past summer in Hamilton. Yes, the musical Hamilton. He was Alexander Hamilton on stage. That was my first time seeing the show, and uh, walked in kind of blind. I'll tell that story in the in this episode, um, but it was just as amazing as uh, as people have said. So if you haven't seen it, go for it. Also, see it in Chicago when Robert's doing it. It's transformative. It's so good, and he's so good in it. Uh, we talk about how he uh, got into theater and uh, how he didn't really know what it was at the time and his journey le- that led him to where he is today. We talked about how he went to a college that he wasn't super crazy about to begin with, but then he got the opportunity to really chase his dream and make that jump. And what that was like, having that leap of faith to really follow your dreams. Uh, We talked about his Broadway debut, and it's one of the best stories ever, and you're just going to love it, and it's great. We talked about how he uh, had to learn sign language for a show, and what that was like. And then, of course, we talked about Hamilton, uh, what that process was like, how long he auditioned for it, for years before finally getting it, and then how it was doing his first show uh, as Alexander Hamilton. So let's just get right into it. Let's do this. Here is The Interesting Podcast, episode number 102 with Robert Ariza. Theme song time. Yeah. At least you get seasons, but you also it gets really cold in Chicago, so you kind of gotta you gotta pay it's for it a little. True. I've been here since uh, the end of December of last year, and Ooh. it was a terrible winter, I have to say. Ooh, that was the like negative fifty degrees year, wasn't it? Yeah, polar vortex. It was pretty awful. Huh? Huh? Did you go outside? The news said don't. <laughs> I did not. No, we actually had a, a two show day the day of the vortex that were canceled. Oh, man. Yeah. What is that even like to be in that cold? Well, uh, the only other time I've been in a polar vortex was when I was at school at Michigan. And uh, I did go out during that polar vortex. I went to get some uh, breakfast with a friend of mine. So we took a little walk. And I remember walking outside and just feeling like the moment that I stepped outside, I, it felt like the insides of my nostrils <laughs> had icicles, truly had icicles in them. That's what it felt like. Oh, my God. Like day after tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Scary stuff. Oh, man. Are you, so are you from Michigan? No, no, no. I'm from New York, actually, first. Uh, Queens. Really? Yeah. And then I went to school uh, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Dude. All cold places. What's going on here? <laughs> I don't know, man. The Midwest keeps calling me back. Yeah. <laughs> so, so did you grow up in New York? I did in Queens. That's cool. Yes. What's it like being, growing up in Queens? Uh, well, my neighborhood was pretty quiet. It's, it's still a pretty quiet neighborhood. Uh, and I, I'm one of five kids, and so I was always kind of playing outside with my siblings. And for a long time, actually growing up, my parents, uh, who are immigrants, you know, uh, they, they said, or especially my mother was like, you know, you can only play with, with your siblings and you have to stay on our, on our block. You can't go exploring the neighborhoods and everything like other kids would do. And so we we would have to make do with that. And, uh, until eventually, obviously we got older and finally we were like, okay, you know what? It's time to just branch out and make friends. (laughs) Yeah. So then when did the interest in like, what did music or acting come first? Music first. I I had always loved singing growing up, uh, and I also started to play piano when I was like seven. I think my parents got me into piano lessons, and uh, I I grew up wanting to be uh, like N Sync basically. I wanted to there be like go. a boy band, you know. Fair, I understand. Uh, yeah, but then I I had actually ne- no theater experience growing up, even though I was in New York. My parents never never thought to bring to us to a Broadway show, probably because it was just so expensive to bring yeah. five kids to a show, you know, Fair. and probably 
more of a headache than it would be. Yeah. <laughs> so like they, they would get a sitter for us and they would go out to see shows, which I found out later in life. I didn't. Yeah. We didn't <laughs> And so I'm like, wait, so you guys went to go see all these shows and never thought that the kid was that was like singing to an invisible audience <laughs> in the living room didn't want maybe want to go see cats. Right. <laughs> but, you know, say love you. Right. And uh, it wasn't until the summer before I started high school that I I uh, I had my first theater experience. So my mom actually found out that they were doing some sort of musical show. Uh, a community theater show at the the school that I was going to, but they only do it over the summers. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, oh, well, you know, since you, I, I, when I was accepted to go into school at LaGuardia Arts, Fiorello H. LaGuardia Arts High School in the city in Manhattan. Right on. Uh, and again, you know, I, I wanted to, I was going for voice and I wanted to become a recording artist. That was kind of the plan. Sure. And so she was like, well, you know, since you love to sing and music and all this stuff, she, you should go audition for this, for this thing that they're doing at the community theater uh, you know, whatever it was. She didn't know what it was either. She right. was like, they sing, so you should go sing. Stage. So <laughs> I, I went and I auditioned and uh, they were doing a production of Footloose. Nice. And uh, the next day, I was actually going on a trip with my parents, with my whole family. We were going to Rochester, which was a trip that we made every year because we had family up there, upstate. And uh, we were going for two weeks. And so I got a call later that night of the audition. And it was from the director of the show. And he was like, hey, thanks for so much for coming in today. We really loved your audition. And we would love to give you a call back for tomorrow. And I was like, well, what do you mean? You're calling me back now. Yeah. Because <laughs> right. I did not know any of these terms. You know? Sure. And so he was like, oh, uh, well, we want you to come audition again tomorrow. I was like, oh, well, I already auditioned today and I'm going on vacation tomorrow. He's like, yeah, I saw that you wrote down on your form that you're going to be gone for two weeks. Is that true? And I was like, yeah, we're leaving tomorrow. He's like, oh, well, do you want to be part of the show? I was like, well, yes, yeah. obviously I, I wouldn't have auditioned if I didn't want to be in it. Yeah. He was like, oh, okay. All right. Well, let's, let's do this. Why don't, when you come back from your vacation, why don't you come down to the, the rehearsal hall and we'll, we'll figure something out. I was like, okay, great. There you so, go. I didn't know what that meant, but I went on my vacation, and as soon as I got back, I went down to their rehearsal, and he was like, okay, so just sit down here. We're going to perform the opening number, and, and uh, you can just tell us if this is something that you want to be a part of. I was like, okay, sounds good. That's cool. So they did the opening number, and it was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Oh, my gosh. My mouth must have been on the floor. <laughs> I, I just I can't, I can't describe that feeling of just watching all these people getting up and dancing and singing. And I was just like, yes, yes, I want to be in this right now. Yeah. So that was my first kind of foray into theater. And because of that, um, my godmother, uh, who did actually love going to theater as well, she was like, oh, well, now since you're doing a musical, you should go see your first Broadway show. So she took me to go see a show that was running at the time called Dracula. Oh, sweet. Um, <laughs> at the time was probably the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Sure. Right there flying witches and naked women and all this stuff. <laughs> and, 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 um, and then in, in hindsight, I'm like, that was a pretty bad show, <laughs> but you know, it, it was, it was you didn't know. <laughs> exactly. I didn't know. I didn't know until I started to see other things later that summer. I saw Phantom of the Opera for the first time. And I was like, Oh, Ooh. okay. okay. <laughs> now I get it. Mm hmm. Oh, man. What is Phantom of the Opera like? It's the longest-running show ever, right? The longest-running Broadway show. Right. The longest-running show ever was The Fantastics, which was a show that was running off-Broadway for a long time. Oh. Um, it closed recently, I want to say maybe a couple of years ago. And so I think it might still hold the title for the longest-running show ever. But um, at, the, at, at any rate, Phantom of the Opera is the longest-running Broadway show. Um and I've seen it a couple of times. So that first time was when I was uh, about to start high school. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it again. I, I want to say it was uh, after I graduated from college and I moved back to New York. And a friend of mine had gotten uh, comps to see uh, – or not comps, but she, got, uh, she found a, a couple of cheap seats to go see Norm Lewis perform as the nice. Phantom. And he was the first uh, black – black actor to play the role yeah. so that was a deal 
So it was cool to go go see that. And then I saw it again one other time after that. A friend of mine actually from Michigan, from the program, uh, was cast as the alternate for uh, Christine Daae. And so she was making her debut in the role. And so a bunch of us from the school went to go see her debut. There you go. Yeah. That's cool. That's a show I've always wanted to see. It's, I mean, it's iconic. And it's it's the iconic. Whole... At the very least, it's iconic. It's funny uh, seeing it several times. Every time I go, I've gone back to see it, I definitely get a sense that it's like, it feels a little bit like a museum piece, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's like, oh, it's just always going to be there, and it's always going to be the same, you know? Yep, yep. <laughs> Which, yep. There, there are pros and cons to that, you know? It, it doesn't necessarily mean that I want to go back anytime soon, for that matter. Sure. But, uh... But I'm glad that it's there, and I'm glad that it continues to bring tourists to the city to keep theater alive and keep people hopefully getting getting the theater bug so that they go to see something else, maybe. You yeah, know? absolutely. So how did that how did that first show go for you at Footloose? Oh my gosh! I mean, it was life changing. I, I absolutely loved every minute of it, and I remember thinking, "Oh, I can't wait to do this again next summer," you know. And I didn't I didn't know that it was something that. Like even even after after having gone to see like Broadway shows, I didn't really wrap my head around what what I was seeing, and I didn't really think about all that went into it, right? So I was sure. just thinking, I I didn't know that people made a career out of that, and so I went to high school and continued to you know want to be a recording artist, and then uh, my freshman year at LaGuardia, they were doing a production of West Side Story. Sweet. I'd, I'd never heard of it, so I didn't know what I was getting into, but my family went to go see it, and I remember from the opening of the show, you know, the orchestra starts playing, and I was like, whoa, this is, like, unlike anything yeah. else, and it was obviously such a compelling story, and the dancing was amazing and everything, and so by the time intermission rolled around, I remember feeling, this, the distinct feeling that I was like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. That's so cool. Yeah, I had unlocked the door, and I was like, this, this has all the answers. Yeah, just clicked. Yeah. That's so That's cool. cool. To have those kind of moments as well, like where you where you recognize it's like something almost spiritually just clicks and you're like, Oh, oh, okay. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. So did you have a favorite member of NSYNC? Ooh. I know. I asked the hard ones. <laughs> well here's the thing. I definitely had a crush on J C. Fair. Fair. But I think everyone's favorite was Justin Timberlake, just because he was the front man. Gotta be the ramen hair and everything. Full, yeah, full you, know, you know, yeah. it was cool back then. Yeah, it's true. Hey, I had the marionettes. They had the... <laughs> <laughs> I definitely had the marionettes. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny to talk about. I was just talking to my wife about this the other day. I was like, "You don't understand. There were toys of In Sync that were actual marionettes that came together to make like you don't understand what it was like." Yeah, it was. A, I mean, yeah, that's it was crazy. The 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 fandom was really big. Yeah, and then you've got Britney Spears, and then when they get together, you're like, what is going on? Oh, yeah, that was a whole other level. Yep. Yeah. Denim on denim on denim. He has so much denim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? That's yeah. crazy, though. So then when you realized that this was something that you could do, like, for a living, how did you how'd you go about that? To be like, did you drop your denim down and be like, all right, the boy band thing is now different? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I I will say I was not dressing like NSYNC. I definitely didn't feel cool enough to dress like yeah. NSYNC. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was very, very, very uh, uh, plain for most of my high school fashion, so to speak. Uh, I I was wearing hand me downs for most of it. You know, same sibling. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I, I'm one of five kids, and I'm in the middle of that. So oh, I had two older. Brothers. I was just taking their clothes once they were outgrown. Yeah, of course. Why not? Um. But for me, yeah, after so after seeing that production, I had also uh, made a one of my best friends uh, in high school, my friend Josephine, who's also an actress now. Um, she she had grown up with theater and doing community theater and had just loved musical theater from such a young age. And so when I met her and I had my like little album of Phantom and Les Mis, you know, yeah. those were like the only albums that I owned. She was like oh, but there's so much more than those shows. You know, there's this and there's that. And she would kind of expose me to all this other theater that I had no idea about, obviously. And so that kind of dug my, my dug me deeper into the, into the rabbit's hole, so to speak. And that's kind of how I became, I guess, what, what you would call a nerd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Music theater nerd. You're among friends. 
<laughs> and it, absolutely. And, um, and you kind of have to be in this business, I think, you know, I think so too. Yeah. Um, cause if you don't love it, then what are you doing here? <laughs> I agree. What's the point? You're going to be spending a lot of time doing it. So <laughs> well, also a lot of time just getting no, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. So if you're, if you don't love it, then yeah, you can't, you can't do it. Um, anyway, so, so I began to just listen and expose myself to a lot more theater because of her and because of, of my love for it. And, uh, I, I made sure that I auditioned for the show that they were doing the following year. And I definitely obviously wanted to do the community theater shows again. And, and I started to find like other, other outlets. Like, uh, my sophomore year, I found out that there was this all girls school in Queens that obviously they do musicals and, and they needed boys. And so they would basically like ask other high school boys to come be a part of their shows, right? audition for them. And so me and my boyfriend at the time, we both auditioned for this production of Bye Bye Birdie at uh, Smart Lewis Academy. Yeah. And so we did that. And I just, yeah, I just kind of took it over from there, just delving into uh, getting to know as much about the art form that I could. And by the time, you know, it came around for college auditions, I, I knew that I wanted to go to a school that focused on musical theater that had a good, strong musical theater program. Sure. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know much about what what was involved in the college uh, application process or even looking for colleges or, or whatnot until my friends started to talk about it and everyone was talking about it junior year. And so everyone had their list of like 10 to 20 schools that they were like, oh, yeah, these are the schools that I'm going to audition for and I apply for and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, oh, wow, I don't have anything like that. So I, I better start doing my research, right? Right. So I started to compile a list of all the best schools that I had heard about for musical theater. And I brought a list of maybe like 10 schools to my parents. And I was like, okay, these are the schools I want to apply to. And my mom was like, went down the list and basically crossed off anything that was too expensive or out of state or, you know. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> Everyone yeah. else was auditioned for these schools. Why can't I? But, you know, I was a very good student and good boy. That helps. And I was like, I, I have to respect my parents. And I, and I, I ended up applying for the schools that they wanted me to apply to, which, you know, I, I can't say that I regret doing because I don't know that if I had done what I wanted back then that I would have ended up where I am now. Right. But at the same time, it was tough. It's tough to look back on that time because I know that my heart wanted something and I couldn't do it because my parents at the time were just scared of what, what really going for that you know, a, a career as an actor is not something that they had any experience with in any of their ancestry or anything. And so right. it's very foreign to them. And they were like, well, obviously, actors just struggle. That's always the, the image of an artist, right? Oh, it's like, yes. They're never going to be financially stable and blah, 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 which is there is definitely truth to that. And so I can't blame them for that. Right. And so I ended up um, applying and getting into Queens College, which was a commuter school there in Queens wasn't far from home. I could still live at home and nice. just come nice. and, and, uh, and I got a little bit of a scholarship. So it was already cheap. And my parents were like, if you go here, we'll pay for your tuition. I was like, okay, great. I can't argue with that. Beautiful. So I was upset obviously that I couldn't go to the school of my choice or, or a school that had a musical theater program, but I was like, I'm going to make the best of it. So of course. I signed up as a drama major and then, um, uh, I had some friends from my high school that actually ended up going to their classical voice program there. And so they convinced me that I should also add a double major for voice. So that way I can continue to work on my musicality. Smart. And so I did that and I ended up uh, double majoring in voice and drama there for three years. And at the beginning of my third year, I i mean, I, I really tried to make it work there. I was like taking dance classes in the dance department and I was obviously taking my dance and my music classes. But ultimately, I just wasn't getting what I knew I needed to have that full musical theater education that was going to get me through my career. Right. So I got fed up at the beginning of my third year and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I have to, I have to, I have to go to a school that I know is going to give me what I need. And my parents were not happy about this, obviously. So they were like, they were like, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it on your own. Right. And so I did. And I was like, well, you know, college applications are expensive. I can't really afford to just apply to a bunch of places willy nilly. So I did a lot of research and I came down to the decision between two schools, uh, what they called, you know, a target school, which is the school that, you know, you can get into. And then your dream school, which is your reach school, you know, something that like if it happened, 
you have to go there because it's just an incredible opportunity. Sure. So my target school was Pace University. It was there in New York. I wouldn't have to uh, leave home. And I knew that they had in the past given hefty scholarships to people. So I was like, I can get in here, you know? Sure. And then uh, I my reach school was University of Michigan. Ooh. Best, best musical theater, arguably, in the, in the world. Right. So I auditioned for both. For Pace, it was easy. I could just audition in New York, obviously, because that's where the campus is. And for Michigan, as a transfer student, they said that they could not see me in one of the unified auditions is what they call them. So they, sometimes for those schools that are in the Midwest or in other states, they will have like kind of these general auditions for, for people that are out of state, like either in big cities like New York or Chicago, oh. um, to make it easier for people to go audition for them. Right. But for students they said it's different you have to go to the campus to audition and I was like well how am I going to afford this I have like you know however much money I had in my account at the time which was not much and so I actually sought some financial aid from my school I I I, you know I went to the head of the music department I was like hey so uh as you know I'm I'm applying for transfer to the University of Michigan and I need to go to the campus to audition and I was wondering if there was anything that you can do to help me out and it's funny, I actually to be talking about this now because I was just talking about this with someone in my cast yesterday about how uh, it was not a very pretty conversation <laughs> met with a lot of uh, resistance and a big lecture about how I was making a big mistake leaving the school. Of and so, obviously I did not get any, any help there. Yeah. Uh, same thing from the head of the drama department. And so I kind of got, gathered all the money that I had to my name and I bought a round trip ticket used basically every last penny I had. And so I had my ticket to go to the audition and come back, but I had nowhere to stay. I, you know, didn't have money for a hotel or, or transportation to and from the, the airport and all that stuff. And so, uh, my, my mom did end up driving me to the airport to get on the flight, but I mean, it was definitely a very, uh, cold car ride. I bet, I bet. Yeah. And she gave me some some cash to have in case I needed to take a cab or something like that just to be safe. But sure. what I ended up doing was I, I, I reached out to someone that I went to high school with, uh, my friend Paul. I mean, we were not that close in high school, but we knew each other and we were friendly with each other. And so I knew that he was going to that school for voice at Michigan. And so I reached out to him I have, after having not spoken to him since high school. And I was like, hey, so... Uh, it's, uh, but I'm coming to audition for a few days. It was, is there any way that I can stay with you while I'm there? I don't really have any other options. He's like, oh yeah, of course, like not a problem. So I was like really grateful for that. Nice. Obviously. And I went, I did my audition and it was kind of a, a really, uh, sobering experience because I, I went there by myself and I'm with, with all these freshman applicants who are younger than me and who are with their parents and they're all bright eyed and bushy tailed and excited. And I'm sort of sitting there in a corner by myself thinking like, Whoa, this is a very different experience for me. Yeah. Um, and even down to the, to the audition, I mean, I, I got into the room and upon first glance, they didn't know that I was a transfer applicant. I didn't really look any older than the students around me, right. but then they looked at my file and they saw that I was a transfer applicant. They were like, Oh, you're a transfer applicant. Okay. This Ooh. is going to be, a little bit, and the whole room changed. The whole, the whole oh, vibe. Oh man! And it was just very serious. Suddenly, you know. Right. But you know, I, I did everything I had to do. I auditioned, and and then they asked me a few questions about why I wanted to transfer, and I told them the whole story about, you know, when I was a senior in, in high school and I couldn't apply for the schools that I wanted to, so I went to the school that my parents chose, and I didn't get the education I wanted, and all this stuff. And then after that, I I just went home and had to just wait. And eventually I did obviously get into the school, which was funny because I ended up getting waitlisted at pace, Oh, uh, which was totally not the turnout that I expected. Right. <laughs> and, uh, following my acceptance into Michigan, I got a letter, uh, or an email rather a couple weeks later from the head of the, the musical theater department saying that they were very impressed with my audition and they were very glad that I made the trip all the way from New York to go, meet them in person and they said that they wanted to offer me a department endorsed scholarship and it wasn't going to be a full ride but it was going to be as much as they could 
could manage to give me. And so what that ended up being was a little bit less than half a scholarship um, with with the uh, knowledge that I could apply for more every year. Oh, cool. So when I brought that news to my parents, I was like, there's no way that I can't not right. go to school. I mean, they're offering me money. That's beyond what I even expected. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And so much to their chagrin, I, I went. That's what it takes, though, I think. There's, there's that moment when you realize what you're going to do, and then you got to take that – you got to jump. Exactly. Yeah, I took the leap, and it was uh, uh, definitely worth it. I mean, my time there at Michigan really, really shifted the way I looked at myself as a human, as a performer, and gave me a lot of confidence that I needed to come back to New York and eventually start working. There you go. What What are What is an audition for? Like, like you said, you had to audition to get into the school. Did you have to have like a song prepared and all these other things? Like. So back then it was different from what I understand anyway, that it's different than it is now for most programs. A lot of programs now will, will have you do an audition like video that you send in as a pre-screen. Okay. And so you might not even end up getting to do a live audition for some schools because there are so many, there are so many programs and there's so many applicants nowadays because the, the field has gotten bigger and more, uh, more attention, I guess, in the past couple of years. Right. Thank you, Hamilton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so back when I auditioned, it was just, you know, you had to go to the school, get an audition slot, and then they would, uh, usually the requirements were they would have you do two 16-bar uh, audition cuts and then a monologue. Okay. And so I think I sang, what was it? I think I sang She Loves Me from She Loves Me. Nice. And a song called... Uh, it took me a while from a musical called John and Jen. I like it. And I, can't, I cannot remember what my monologue was. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it was, it worked. I know that when my first round of auditions, I used a monologue from a play called Sophistry. Oh. So I, I most likely used that audition, that monologue, but I couldn't tell you for certain. <laughs> sure. Whatever it was, it, it happened. It happened. It worked. Yeah. That's pretty neat. So you went to school at Michigan, then you went back to New York, I assume. Yes, yes. I went back to New York after, well, after, I, while I was at Michigan, actually, I started working professionally um, uh, at a summer stock theater in uh, Kansas, in Wichita, Kansas, called Music Theater Wichita. Oh, so nice. So they host auditions in several locations for their season, and they do five shows a season every summer. And they, they specifically audition at the University of Michigan because they hire a lot of people, a lot of students from the school because there's a lot of talent there. So it was very easy for me to be able to audition for them. I didn't have to go anywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. And so my after my first year at Michigan, I auditioned there and got in. And so I did their first season of five shows uh, the summer of 2012. And then every year that I auditioned after that, I got accepted. And so I did three summers consist, uh, consecutively there at Music Theater Wichita, which, you know, it was amazing for me because I got paid to do what I love, which was to me like the craziest thing ever. Yeah. Uh, even though it's not, you know, it, it's not the best paying job, but at the time I was not a member of equity. And so, right. Uh, it was, it was good for, for the time, you know? Yeah. Something. Uh, and then as a result, uh, from working there for three summers, I ended up uh, getting a contract my last summer there for their production of 42nd Street, they offered me an equity contract to perform one of the lead roles. Nice. And, uh, I got back to New York with my equity card, which was a huge help. I bet. I bet. It's like being SAG for screen stuff. Exactly. It's like once you're in, then it, it opens up a hundred other doors. Yeah, it just gives me protection under the, the union and, and, and allows me to audition for shows that I otherwise probably couldn't be seen for as a non-equity actor. Sure. And that's pretty neat that you're going to school for the thing you want to and also getting the practice as well because you're doing it at the same time. That's like exactly double winning. Yeah. And I, I don't, and you know, I, I didn't really even know what summer stock was when I was in college at my, at my first college at Queens college. Right. So that's just one of the many, many ways that I, I uh, was able to get ahead in, at Michigan. I love that like this whole world existed and you were clearly meant for it, but you didn't catch it until later on. 
It was almost like life held you back so that you got to an age where you could like really experience and appreciate it. And it was like, yeah, here. You, it's, <laughs> I, yeah th- I always think about that because I think about how much I've had to fight to be able to do this. Because even, even after I uh, got into Michigan and, and my parents, you know, they, they still weren't very supportive of me going there and of me continuing to pursue acting as a career. Right. It, it caused a lot of strain on our relationship while I was away. And when I came back to New York, I, I remember, you know, just like I, I started to work, uh, within a, fir- within the first, um, what was it? Maybe six months of auditioning, maybe less than that. And really, and I started to work, yeah, regionally, like pretty, pretty, I, I had like three shows back to back, which was really, really lucky after my first year. And, dude, and, um, you know, I could tell that my parents were like happy every time that I would obviously get a job, but, but then they would ask me how much it would pay and it wasn't necessarily what they wanted to hear. And, you know, that kind of thing. but for me, I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm working. This is, this is it, you know, right. it's going to get better from here. And eventually that, that all led to me making my Broadway debut a year after being back in New York, you know, Dude. and I know that once I reached that point, once I finally got that contract, I could tell that a big weight was lifted off my parents' shoulders and thus my shoulders as well, because I could feel that they were like, okay, you're doing exactly what you said you were going to do all this time. So we right. trust, you know, I felt a sense of trust from them that I had never really felt before. Sure. Sure. <laughs> And th- them being theater fans as well, when you hit that level, it's like, oh, okay, exactly. got exactly. it, man. So, what was it like, Broadway debut? Like, dude, you can say those words. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it never gets old being able to say that. <laughs> I, I bet. Well, was, so, what was that like? So it was, uh, it was in a, a Spring Awakening, the revival, of Spring Awakening, the Deaf West revival, which uh, half the cast were deaf actors, and so I had to learn sign language. Oh, for cool. The, which, in and of itself, was an incredible experience but yeah. also that show spring awakening i remember when it came out when i was in high school it was a huge part of our generation and i listened to that cast recording every day you know i was obsessed with it yeah and um i remember auditioning for it when i was in high school going to like one of the open calls where like thousands of kids were like lined up uh, on the streets of new york to get seen and uh i remember getting called back maybe like five months after that audition, they, they had called me in again and I was like, Whoa, I get to audition for Broadway. Like yeah. <laughs> I didn't get it. You know, I had no idea what I was doing really, but, right. but it was just cool to be able to say that I did. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's very full circle to like have that be my Broadway debut, the revival of that show. Um, what? and what? yeah, it was pretty wild. And and you know, it's funny, Broadway is not, n- not nearly as glamorous as, people dream it up to be, I bet. but, but that doesn't take away at all from the, the, the wonder of it, I guess, you know, like yeah. going to the, going to work and going to, into the stage door every day, instead of going through like the theater doors that every, all the other patrons go to. It's just like, that was yeah. like such a unique feeling, you know, it was just like, I work here, this is <laughs> my place of business, you know, like, it just was really, really awesome. And I was a swing in that production, so I wasn't on stage every day, which was fine. You know, at the time, I was just, like, grateful to be making my Broadway debut. And, yeah. and I, I had never been a swing before, so that was its own challenge. Um, and it made me really appreciate when I did actually finally get to make my performing debut on Broadway, right. which we're actually coming up on the anniversary of. It's uh, the 5th. October 5th was the day that I made my Broadway debut. Dude, congrats. Yeah, yeah. It'll be, uh, what is it, four years on Saturday. Wow. Happy anniversary, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, pretty pretty wild. Um, and it was great because I had the, that date in advance. Like when I got the, the job, the offer for the job, I was told that I had that date coming up. Mm-hmm. And I bet that was most likely going to be my first date on in the show. And so I was able to tell all of my family and friends, you know, in advance, like to get tickets and it was a Monday night. So a lot of people were able to come, you know, even people who were doing other shows, because usually Monday nights are dark for Broadway shows, but our schedule was different. We had one. So I ended up having like 200 people there to see me. Dude. Yeah. And it was wild. It was absolutely wild. I mean, at the end of the show, uh, I took my bow and it was just like, 
the whole cast, we were leaving the stage and they like, they like basically forced me to stay on stage. There you go. Except my standing ovation, you know, it was just like so wild. So, so wild. There was so much love in that theater that day. And, uh, it's something that I really will, will never forget. It, it's one of the best nights, if not the best night of my entire life. Yes. Yeah. Dude, I'm beaming. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. what? what is swing? What does that mean? Okay, so a swing in a show is – so you know what an understudy is, right? Yes. Uh, you know, an understudy covers a role, uh, and, and most of the time an understudy is usually in the ensemble of the show. Right. In addition to understudying, like, one of the lead roles. So a swing is someone who, who, who basically understudies or covers the ensemble tracks of the show. Oh, so they have to cover anywhere between like four to ten tracks, depending on the show and the, the demands of the show. Goodness. And so for that show, I was covering four different ensemble tracks. And for, because Spring Awakening doesn't really have an ensemble, all the, all the roles were like kind of supporting roles. Right. So it was a lot of work, you know. I bet. Wow, and I didn't know that. Sign language, I had to learn basically all the sign language in the show. Oh, man. Did it take you a long time to learn sign language? You know, I had never signed before, uh, before my audition. And so I had to learn some sign for the audition. And I worked tirelessly at it to make sure I was impeccable. <laughs> yeah, you got to be. When I started uh, rehearsals, I, I met all these deaf actors and they were, you know, signing with me. And I was like, ah, I can't sign back. This is so embarrassing, yeah. you know. <laughs> So I, I immediately went home and started to research uh, on YouTube some, some – I found this, uh, this kind of like – it was a class at a university that they had put online. Oh, nice. And so I basically took the class on YouTube Smart. and learned, learned sign uh, in the matter of a couple of weeks maybe. And, you know, it was kind of an it's, – it's an ongoing process. It's not like, okay, now I know sign language. You know, right. it's like of it kind of, over time, the better you get at it. And also – I I befriended one of the other swings in the cast who is a deaf actress, but she um, she's able to speak English. Oh, nice! Uh, and she has a hearing aid, so she you know so she communicates in English and in sign language. And so she was a great great uh, person for me to be able to practice with backstage and during rehearsals and stuff. And uh, I learned a lot having her as a friend. That's so cool! And just yeah. another thing for your toolbox, man. Exactly, exactly. Right on. So what was something, you know, having dreamed of Broadway for so long, how was, like, I've talked to enough people that I've learned, a dream job is still a job. You know, you yes. have this idea, but then, like, there's so much work that goes into it, you know, an overnight success is 10 years in the making type stuff. So, like, when you when you got to Broadway, how was it different than you expected it going in? Ooh, uh, the, the backstage space is a lot smaller than I expected. Really? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I and I had been uh, like on stage uh, on Broadway stages before when I had seen other friends that had been on Broadway like and been brought on stage. But I guess I never really took in the size of certain backstage spaces on Broadway, especially Broadway theaters. You think, oh, Broadway, you know, like it's going to be big and lavish. But it turns out Broadway theaters are actually some of the small, smallest theaters in the country when it comes oh. to performing, you know, Broadway sized musicals. Like now that I've been on tour, I did uh, the tour of Les Mis last year and what? and you know going across the country to all these different states to all these different theaters these theaters are massive like two to three thousand seat theaters right and on Broadway there most of them are like somewhere between one thousand and like just under two thousand you know right so they're a lot smaller and uh the backstage space definitely shows that too yeah <laughs> uh, you know, the dressing room spaces, everything, everything is just kind of like, it seems very cozy. Right. Compared to the things that I experienced on the road. That's why the cast that's, gets so close. Ex yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's definitely one of the reasons. Yeah, you kind of have to. Oh, man. Les Mis, a tour? That's, that yeah. sounds like a lot of work. Les Mis is a crazy it's, show. Uh, yeah. A three-hour show. <laughs> oh, man. Did you ever awesome. get sick? Yeah, I did. I did. I Actually, a, a lot of times, you know, and with theater, it's it's so tricky because you're spending all your time with the same group of people, especially when you're on the road, right? Sure. And you're you're very intimate, like sharing dressing rooms and being on stage with each other. And sometimes, like, 
uh, sharing stage kisses or or hugs or whatever. You're just like in close proximity with these people right. uh, every day. And so if one person gets sick, it's more likely oh. than not to spread around the cast. And that's exactly what happened with Les Mis several times. So, uh, uh, you know, and it's unfortunate because it, it really is the responsibility of the actor to know when to call out of a show. Right. And I think people were stubborn and didn't want to lose money or whatever it was. Right. Right. Um, and so they would show up to work and they were sick and they would just kind of push through it. But great. That might be okay for you, but then you get someone else sick and then it starts this whole chain reaction, you know? Right. <laughs> then it's on. Exactly. So there was uh, one city, I think we were in Norfolk, Virginia that I had the flu. So I was out for maybe I think three shows. Ooh, man. Yeah. And traveling when you're sick too is gotta be exactly. the worst. It was, it was awful. And you have to take care of yourself because no one's going to take care of you. Yeah, it's true. They're worrying about themselves. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, man. So then what brought you to Chicago then? Uh, well, now I'm in Hamilton. Yeah, you are. You're my Hamilton, actually. Fun fact. Oh, so, did you think so? I saw the show. This was uh, – it would. so whenever the taste was happening, which I think was July – was it oh, yeah, yeah, in July, yeah. Okay, so I was, uh, my wife and I just took a random day trip to Chicago, and it just so happened to be the taste. We're like, oh, cool. And then I was like, I'm pretty sure Hamilton's playing. So we caught in a, it was a Sunday matinee, and oh my gosh. you were Hamilton, so dude, you're my Hamilton. That's crazy. Yep. That's a, the, the next day was when I reached out to you. I was like, that guy needs to be on my show. Oh, my gosh. That's yep. Awesome. Yep, yep. <laughs> thanks, thanks for saving that surprise till now because I love that. <laughs> yep. I, ne- I sat on it for a while. <laughs> it was, dude, transformative. And oh. you know it's crazy? Talking about how you growing up like didn't know about Broadway or anything like that, yeah. we didn't know anything about Hamilton. So, oh, that's great! It's a phenomenon, right? So we've yeah. heard we've heard of it. Obviously, we're like, there's a there's a Broadway show. It's about yeah. Alexander Hamilton. It's contemporary music. Well, I was like, all right, cool. It's pretty much all I need. So walking into that theater with those expectations, which is nothing, and walking <laughs> out of that theater was like, what did we just experience? We are like different about- people. Yeah. Yeah, it was incredible. In- the second the stage started moving, I was like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Yeah, dude. You're amazing. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Had to had to embarrass you uh, while we're talking. Uh, but <laughs> well, so no, I'm not embarrassed. I'm flattered. Good. You should be. It's incredible. Uh, so I'm wondering, what is for something like that, Hamilton being the phenomenon that it is? What is that audition like to have that sort of mantle? Oh, okay. Well, I first auditioned for the show. Back when it, so it first opened in uh, July 2015. Mm-hmm. I saw the show in November 2015, which was the same season that Spring Awakening was. So I oh, was in sweet. the, which is pretty cool to be able to say that I was in that same uh, Broadway season. Yeah. Um, so I saw the show and obviously I was like, I have to be in this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I emailed my agents and I was like, hey, I really want to be seen for this. Please, I want to be seen. And and when I saw the show, I I thought, you know, I can't, I, I never really identified as a dancer. Sure. And sure. so I was like, I can't really be in the ensemble because they really dance. And I'm not really old enough to play Hamilton yet. So the, the one role that I felt like was the best fit at the time was John Lawrence, Philip Hamilton. Nice. And so I told my agents, I was like, I really need to be seen for this role. And they're like, okay, great. We'll see what we can do. And they said that they submitted me for the role. And then the casting office actually got back to them and said, oh, we don't want to see him for that role. We want to see him for the ensemble. And I was like, but they know that I don't dance. (laughs) (laughs) We just covered this. (laughs) uh, Right. And I was like, that's so frustrated by that. Right. But obviously I went in and I, I did uh, a couple of songs from the show for them and then uh, didn't hear back for, I don't know, maybe a month. And then they started to call me in for the role of Hamilton. And I was like, what? Dude. I was like, I'm way too young to be playing this role, yeah. but I'm going in, obviously. Of course. And so I, it was weird because what they have what they call auditions, right, which is where you go in front of either the casting director or the creative team and you actually, like, just perform the songs for them, mm-hmm. and that's it. But then they have what they call work sessions is where it's, like, kind of an audition, but it's they don't want to call it that. Oh. So a work session is where you go and you work in with some of the creatives from the show, and they literally work through some of the material with you. Like, they give you notes, and they and you do things several times, and they kind of 
help you guide you through how to approach the material. Right. Like you're actually doing it. Yeah. And so that's what I was doing for, for a while. Uh, every few months they would call me in again for Hamilton, sometimes for another role in addition to that. And, and we just work on stuff. Wow. Then every now and then an audition would pop up. And so they would see me for an audition and then I would get a call back and then I wouldn't hear her. And then it would be back to the work sessions, you know? Yeah. This went on for two and a half years before I actually. Wow. Good yeah. Lord. I probably auditioned somewhere around 20 times before I finally got it. Sheesh. Yep. Wow. Good thing you wanted it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I really, I mean, yeah, this show is groundbreaking in so many ways. And the moment I saw it, I, I knew that I was going to be in it. Whether it was within a year or years or whatever it was, I was like, I'm going to be in the show. I know it. Damn right. And to be honest, I'm a little surprised. I was very surprised when it actually happened because I had gotten close many times before that. And it started to get to a point where I was like, I, I can't be like any, I, like, I don't know what to do differently, you know? Right, right. <laughs> it's like frustrated, right? Like the, the last time that I actually got the, the email from my agent saying, oh, so Hamilton wants to see you again. I wasn't even excited about it, to be honest. I was <laughs> went straight to being frustrated. I was like, ah, oh, what do they want now, you know? Sure. Uh, and so I went through the motions and I did the auditions and I got callback after callback. And my boyfriend um, was kind of with me. Like we, we were starting to date around the time that I was like, um, getting all these callbacks mm -hmm. and he was like, I, I think you're going to get it. And I was like, no, this is what happens. They call me back <laughs> and, I, and I just don't get it. And, and then I got it. <laughs> Dude, what was I that was, like after two and a half years? I really couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I really thought that cause I had just gone back from tour from Les Mis, uh, in September mm -hmm. um, of 2018 and then I did a couple of readings and I did a developmental uh, project for three weeks of this new musical, which is where I met my boyfriend. And then after that, uh, that project is when we started to date and is when I started to get all these auditions. And so um, it was kind of crazy because it was for this production in Chicago and I knew that I wasn't going to not do it, obviously. Sure. But it just meant like, here I was thinking I was finally going to be in New York again full time, you know, because sure. I had really missed being in New York when I was on tour. I loved touring. It was an incredible experience and I wouldn't trade it for, for anything. But but I was ready after a year of touring. I was ready to be to be in one place again, you know, I bet. And I wanted that to be New York because that was where the business is, where home is, you know. Mm -hmm. But then here I was suddenly like I within a couple of weeks, I was going to be moving to Chicago to be in this show. And so. I was, it was, I was met with a mixture of like utter, like just shock at actually getting the job, but then also kind of like, um, devastation because I was like, I, I have to uproot my life and I, I'm dating this guy and I, I really, really like him. And I, you know, I, what is he going to say? You know? Right. Um, and it turns out he was totally down to at least try the long distance. And so we've been doing long long distance since I've moved out here and and it's actually been really great. We've been we've been getting stronger every day. And uh I'm obviously very very looking forward to going home in January. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Right on. That's when you know you got someone good, man. Exactly. Exactly. So do you remember your first show as Alexander Hamilton? Yeah, March seventeenth. March seventeenth. Uh, yeah. It's funny, it's it was it was uh a blur. It is a blur. I really don't remember much of it. Yeah, that's fair. You just you, uh, you hit the groove. It's just a massive role. And, yeah. and when I did my put in rehearsal, which is the rehearsal that they do for you, like once you've learned all the, the blocking and the music and all the words and everything like that, mm -hmm. then you do a, a run through with the cast as that role. So that way you can, you know, before you do it for an audience. Oh, cool. Smart. Um, so I did that. But I had, I think I did that put in rehearsal probably like the end of January. And then they didn't, I, I didn't do the role until March. Oh, okay. So it, a lot of time had passed before I had gotten to actually do the role again. Right. Then I started to do my ensemble track. And so 
upon doing the role, I had one rehearsal to kind of like brush up, make sure everything was still in my brain. Right. And, you know, everything, I always felt very in control in rehearsals of the role and everything like that. And didn't feel like anything too beyond what I was able to do with my capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it was like the day came and I wasn't nervous. I don't really, really get nervous for anything, but I just remember being like, it just happened. I just remember suddenly it was the end of the show and I was like, oh, I did it. Killed it. I was like, but I, but I was like, was it good? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I can't remember. I can't remember if I like messed anything up. I can't remember if 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 it was just a train, you know, like I couldn't remember. I was like, it was a little bit of like a, whoa, did that really just happen? Yeah. yeah. And so I I had a big group there and I brought them on stage afterwards and and everyone was like crying and, and so excited and, and happy for me. And I was just like, I had this dazed look on my face. So they're like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah. I was just like, was it good? <laughs> Grab someone. Yeah. Who are you? You were amazing. You were phenomenal. I was like, okay, good, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you were there for it. Mm -hmm. At least one of us was. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's awesome, though. How, how many shows have you done now? Ooh, I, I honestly haven't been counting. But I, I go on pretty regularly now that I've once I made my debut, I've been going on probably every other week since then. Nice. Because uh, Hamilton, in every production, only does uh, seven out of the eight performances a week. Right. And so our company has two covers for him, me being one of them. And so we kind of switch off. Right on. That's cool. Which is great because it gives me a lot of opportunities to do the role, obviously. And it's also kind of important because... Again, like to not do that role for a few months and then to suddenly have to do it on a moment's notice yeah. would almost be impossible. <laughs> yep, it's it's so much so much work. That, like you said, it's a massive role. It's a massive role. One of the most massive roles we'll probably find. Yep, and difficult too. That's the other thing. It's not like it's a one that you can just shoe in with the lyrics as well as the blocking and everything like that. There's even for massive roles, it's a really intricate one as well. You know what's funny though? Um, I I, I, so I do three roles in Hamilton. I do my ensemble track, I cover Hamilton, and I cover John Lawrence and Philip Hamilton. Love it. Of the three roles, that's the easiest one for me. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Good. Because yeah. you're that guy. <laughs> yeah. Man. I, I feel most at ease when I'm doing that role. Well, I guess, I mean, by, by this point, I think I'm pretty comfortable in my ensemble track. But I, I, I have to say, it was like, at first, when I was learning it, it's a lot of dancing. And I, like I said before, I never identified as a dancer. I was never really good at it. And to have to do this Tony Award winning choreography yeah. uh, was, was a real challenge. And something that, even to this day, I still, I still struggle with. Because now I'm dealing with the long-term effects of doing, doing this, this uh, physicality, right? Yeah. And like pains in my feet and in my shins and in my back and i'm like oh my gosh i've never experienced so much body pain. <laughs> you know? right yeah i didn't even know that muscle was there <laughs> yeah that's funny do you have a favorite song Ooh. yeah i asked the hard yeah. ones so when i was a, just a fan of the show right before i was in the world of of being in it and all that stuff mm -hmm. i i always loved room where it happens it was just Ooh, like oh good one the first when I first saw the show, that was the one that stuck with me the most. And then after seeing it again, I remember thinking "Satisfied" was the next one that was like, "Oh my gosh, this is just brilliant!" Right? Great one. Then, um, then now being in it, uh, it's so tough. It's so tough. I, okay, in, in the ensemble, I'll have to say that like, um, "Rumor It Happens" still feels pretty awesome. I bet. Um. So that might be my favorite in the ensemble. Um, for John Lawrence, Philip Hamilton, probably, probably the scene where he dies. You know, just because yeah, it's cool. It's cool to die on stage. Yeah, why not? <laughs> and then for Hamilton, honestly, my shot is pretty spectacular. It's a pretty spectacular feeling when you get to the end of the song and you're like. Wow, I definitely just spit out all those words and everyone's screaming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yep. Because especially, you know, I have a, it's like Miguel Cervantes who plays Hamilton full time here in Chicago. He, he originated the role here in Chicago. So he's done it since day one here in Chicago for three years now. Right. right. He just um, a thousand shows. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. 
So he's kind of like a living legend here in Chicago, and he is Bear Hamilton. Like, he's, he's the name that is recognized here in Chicago. And so when people come to see the show and they end up seeing an understudy, I feel like there is a little bit of, like, the disappointment of, like, oh, well, I'm seeing an understudy, right? Mm -hmm. So there's – I have to work a little bit harder at the beginning of the show to kind of, like, get them on my side. Sure. And my shot is the key to that. It's like I know at the beginning of my shot I have to – there has to be some fire, right, that they're going to follow. Right. And I know that I'm successful by the time the end of the number comes and everyone's screaming, you know? That's your gauge. Right. And so by that point, I'm like, okay, now I'm locked in. Now I can do the rest of the show easy peasy. There you go. That's smart. That's so smart. That's smart. I love that. I love that part of the role. And then on the flip side, I love uh, It's Quiet Uptown because it's it's Ooh, one of the yeah. few yeah. moments that Hamilton gets to sing. Yeah. And I sing. Yep. So. Yeah. <laughs> True. Never, True. never in my my wildest dreams as a teenager would I th would I, you know, have imagined that I'd be rapping so much. Yeah, that's true. As Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> exactly. Man, it, is the costume difficult to move in? Because there's a lot of layers in those sort of period costumes. Um, as Hamilton, he doesn't have to do as much dancing, so I don't really notice it as much with Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say with. Yeah, with like John Lawrence, Philip Hamilton, with his costume, there are some times where I'm dancing. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I got <laughs> I gotta work a little harder in this, you know. Sure. Are they but hot? I'm, I'm also a little bit used to it because Les Mis was a lot of very layered costumes. Oh, good point. And they were very tight, so I was a little bit used to that. Sure, you had a lot of training. And yes, it does get hot um, sometimes, but ultimately, I'm not a big sweater compared to some other people. That's got to be nice. <laughs> yeah, it's nice because I never feel, I'm never drenched by the end of the show. That's I'll good. Be, I'll be a little sticky, but never drenched. Sure, sure. Have you ever fallen because the stage moves? Uh, never fallen, but I have lost my balance a little bit. Yeah, I've yeah. been there. The irony of my last name being balance, uh, it follows me around. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> Dude, every time I trip, I feel like I'm letting my whole bloodline down. Like, oh, man. No. And autocorrect is my sworn enemy. Oh, oh yeah. Fun. But that's the, the first thing I thought of with the, when the stage started spinning, I was like, oh, man, that's, yep, I would be that guy. I'd, yeah. be, I'd be the first domino. That's <laughs> funny. It's fun now, though, after, you know, once you get, they have usually in rehearse, in your rehearsal process when you're learning the show, they'll have a day where, like, okay, this is the turntable day. We're going to, like, practice stepping on and stepping off and dancing on it, you know, like, so it's kind of like a little tutorial. Yeah, that's um, definitely good <laughs> to learn. That's a really fun day, and I can always tell it's fun whenever we get a new person in the cast and we they have to do that rehearsal. Um, it's always fun to see it because it's like you see people the joy, you know. It's like it's a playground. Yeah, of course, it's got to be fun. You get it, you actually it, have to have fun doing stuff like that, otherwise it's going to be awful. <laughs> well, that goes back to what we were saying earlier, right? It's like if you if you don't love this, if you're not having fun, then you're you're not doing it right, yeah. and it's not for you, you know. I totally agree. So do you have any advice for somebody who wants to get into theater? Ha, huh. well. I know, right? You have to really, I say, if you love theater, you know, go for it. But you do have to know, what, like, you have to recognize the signs, right? Because I feel like people get signs sometimes at different points in their development as a theater artist or in their career, so to speak, right? Um, and... Everything is not going to work out the way that you want it to, especially at first. Yeah. And so if if you find that your frustration is overpowering your joy and your love of the, the art, then that's a good sign that it's most likely not for you. I think you're right. I think that's really important as well because there's a, a lot of mentality that's like, you know, just keep fighting, just keep fighting, just keep fighting. But I, you bring up a very good point. If the process is what's draining you so much and you're not having fun in that, that's the job. Like <laughs> the job yeah. of an actor is more often than not to audition. That is the job. That's yeah. what they would tell us in school. The job is auditioning and the vacation is when you get a job. Yep. Yep. So if you can't find fun in the auditioning, then it's like, whoa, it's going to be a rough road, buddy. Yeah, absolutely. What? So having gone to like all the training and classes that you've done, was there anything that stuck out as far as – like schooling or training that you've used a whole lot? Like, you know oh. how in school, like, 
you're not going to use a Pythagorean theorem very often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So is there anything that you learned that like comes in handy a whole lot? You know, I, I, I mean, it's it's so maybe lazy to say, but like I really do use almost everything that I've learned. That's at, good. At, even even be, at, at Queens College, you know, um, because I was still taking classes in voice and drama and music. It, it might not have been like critically in, or, you know, it might not have been honed onto musical theater, but it was still stuff that that as an artist is in my toolbox, you know, and it strengthens, strength, strengthens me as a musician, as as a singer, as an actor, all these things. Right. But I guess if it was something that I can like name specifically, I would say that um, my junior year or what they call the junior year at Michigan, mm-hmm. Uh, you take a class called junior performance and the class is is based a lot around sculpting a character and doing like research on a character based on whatever the script gives you so that's something that i definitely take with me every time i approach a new role um or audition for a new role like uh sometimes when you audition for something they'll give you uh, a copy of the script so that way you can you know study basically right in preparation for your audition um, if that's the case, I'll read the script and you know, you don't just focus on the scenes where your character is talking, but you focus on all the times that your character is talked about, right? You talk about which characters talk about you, how they talk about you, what their relationship is to you. You know, all of this is stuff that, that ends up creating a backdrop for who this person is in the world that you're inhabiting. That's good. That's real good. So as somebody who sings for a living, uh, health tips, what do you do? What are your secrets? Warm up, warm up every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the thing. Warming up does not mean vocalizing for hours on end. That is a mistake. Oh. Uh, warming up is going to be different day to day, depending on what your voice needs on any given day. Right. So uh, a warm up can can sometimes be as short as five minutes or it can be as long as half an hour depending on what your needs are. And it doesn't necessarily always involve a bunch of singing. A lot of it has to do with breathing exercises, stretching out your body because, you know, what people make the mistake is like, oh, singing is all up in the head, right? Right. Like, well, no, yes, the sound comes out your mouth, right? But your whole body is engaged when you're singing. Sure. So if there is something going on in a different part of your body that you're not aware of, it could be hindering your voice and your capabilities. So your whole body is, you know, it has to be in perfect equilibrium for you to be able to feel at ease with your singing. Are there a lot of like hypochondriacs in the theater scene? Um, <laughs> I feel like I'd be like, my arm hurts. Hold on. It's going to do the whole, because you have to be so conscious of your body at all times. Well, here's what's interesting. I feel like um, with Les Mis, like I said, with the sickness, <laughs> it's like I was surprised more people weren't hypochondriacs, I guess. Right. Because people didn't take as good care of themselves as I would have imagined. Mm -hmm. Um, But with this show, I would say that people are very, very um, aware of their bodies physically. And whenever there's a pain, no one lets it linger. Like you go, we have a PT person on staff. And so, uh, you know, everyone is in and out of that room pretty regularly to make sure that their bodies are working up to snuff. It's a good way to be. It's kind of your job. You have to be because if you don't, if you just ignore a pain and then over the course of a few months, you know, it gets worse. It could, it could be irreversible damage, you know? Yeah, it's true. You know, better say than sorry. This is, this contract only lasts so long. You have to get work other, other places, you know? Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> Actors, man. <laughs> it's always, yeah. always running. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, dude, we've been talking for over an hour already. Check that out. Nice. <laughs> yeah, we did it. We did it. That's what I'm talking about. Dude, thanks for coming on. This was really fun. I had a great time. Good. I'm glad. Um, thank you so much for, for uh, coming to see the show, and I'm so glad that you got to see me play Hamilton. That's that's really awesome. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If I ever tell anybody, I'm like, yeah, Robert Ariza, that's my Hamilton, dude. So before I forget, uh, where can people find you online? Oh, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at, at Robert Ariza. Love it. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Bobbert Ariza because Better. Robert Ariza was taken when I tried to. Twitter. Of course. Um, 
And uh, you can also uh, look at my website, robertariza.com. Beautiful. And check out Hamilton in Chicago. That's right. We're here to in Chicago till January 5th, and then we close. There we go. That's exciting. Stay warm in the winter. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You uh, stay cool. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm trying my best. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get some sweet gear. Also, I've made a Patreon. So if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows... You can now do that at patreon.com slash Brian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, and JC. Your support means so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well. <laughs>